Hello, Sipul Nation. Welcome to another Sipul Quarta. We're back a week off. And uh, as you guys could see, we have a really special edition today. Talking about skateboarding and everything. You guys saw Derek in the intro video introducing everyone, that, everyone that's going to be here. So please uh, let us know where you guys are from. Send us your questions and messages here in the comment box. If you want to have like your questions right lighted, we're going to use this super chat. And also, we're going to help in two organizations. I'm going to put in a couple minutes the QR codes here, and you guys can donate. It will be in English. And after that, we're going to have Sepultura performing the song Faust from the Dante 21st album. So we're going to have like a lot of people here. So I'm not going to talk too much today. Uh, but you have all info in, on sepultura.com.br slash sepulquarta. And I'm going to leave a message for our, our Brazilian audience here. Olá, Sepul Nation. Boa tarde a todos e todas. É, Bem-vindos a mais uma Sepul Quarta, Sepul Quarta número 24. Muitos convidados e muito especial. É, a gente, vocês puderam ver aí no vídeo de introdução que o Derek colocou, depois da Sepul Quarta aqui do nosso Q&A. Sepultura vai tocar a música False. Dessa vez sem convidados, a banda tocando essa música do álbum Dante 21. E é isso, a gente vai ter duas organizações que nós vamos ajudar aqui durante a Sepul Quarta. Vou colocar o QR Code e logo mais eu vou trazer mais informações. O bate-papo hoje é em inglês, mas vocês podem mandar também umas perguntas em português, porque também temos convidados que falam português. Então, é isso. Estamos prontos aqui para mais uma Sepul Quarta muito especial. Deixem aí nos comentários de onde vocês são. Mandem suas mensagens, usem o Superchat para ter suas perguntas em destaque. E em alguns segundos, vamos começar aqui o bate-papo com todo mundo. Yeah. All right! Yeah. We are alive! <laughs> are <they> on? Yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. You know, it's a fantastic uh, opportunity we have here for Sepul Quarta. Like Bruno was saying, we had the, the last week off, so we could prepare every Wednesday, like with a, a thematic Wednesday. Uh, today, as you can see, we have this, I don't know how you call masters, legends <laughs> of skateboarding of the world. This is so unreal for us, you know, I mean, uh, to have Steve here, Pedro, Bob, um, and Christian, and of course, we're going to talk to Oliver Perkovich from Skatistan, which we met on tour as well. He has a, a fantastic project. And welcome, everyone. We're so happy you guys are here. Thank you very much for being a part of this. Thank you very much. De nada. It's a pleasure. You. Obrigado. Fantastic. So uh, I, I want to start with uh, Oliver, you know, because uh, this project, Skatistan, I don't know if it's everyone is, is uh, um, aware of, of knows about it, you know, but Olive could uh, give like a, a quick uh, resume of, of what's going on, you know, and where it's going on. And uh, yeah, Oliver, welcome. Thanks. You. <laughs> thanks. Thanks so much for, for having me here. Um, Skaystan started in Kabul, Afghanistan in 2007 when I went there. And today we've got skate schools uh, all over the world in South Africa, in Cambodia, and uh, two skate schools in, in Afghanistan. And uh, we use skateboarding as a hook to get kids into education. So a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, street working kids that we're able to connect, uh, connect with through skateboarding, and they come and do one hour in the skate park and then they spend an hour in the classroom. And before COVID, we had around 3,000 children weekly wow. as part of our programs. And uh, we've been working for 12 years now in Afghanistan. And uh, yeah, skateboarding is the largest sport for girls in Afghanistan now through our work. And wow. in, northern, in northern Afghanistan, um, there's probably the highest concentration of female skateboarders anywhere in the world. We've got 700 girls coming to the same spot every week in skateboarding. So it's pretty, uh, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty cool how it's, all, how it's all grown. 
and I, and how that happened, man? Uh, I, I'm I'm sure you were a, a skateboard, you know, uh, you practiced the sport and everything, and and why Afghanistan and how that happened? So I went to I went to Kabul because my girlfriend at the time got a job there. So this was 2007, and uh, I went there with with a skateboard because I'm a skateboarder. I've been uh, skateboarding since 1980, so it was just like what I was. Uh, I, I went there looking for a job, and I started to skateboard around the city. And kids were just really fascinated by the skateboard, and I was super excited that girls were interested to try it out because yeah. girls didn't really do other sports in Afghanistan. They didn't ride bicycles. There weren't women driving cars. But all of a sudden there were girls on skateboards. So that totally stoked me out. And I sort of, I was able to connect, yeah, connect really quickly with the kids through, uh, through skateboarding. And um, it was something that, it was something that spoke, spoke to them i saw that spark in the kids eyes that i had when i first stepped on a skateboard i was six years old when i started skateboarding and it's it's been with me all my life and uh the kids in afghanistan had so little i, I grew up in uh Papua new guinea so i had some experience like being in other places and i traveled to over 40 countries before going to afghanistan but it was uh it was it was an opportunity, and I sort of followed it. The kids, um, the kids were, the kids were excited about skateboarding, and but they also then said, "Hey, we love to skate, but we also want to go to school," and that's how the connection to education came about. And then it was that the girls were um, turning twelve or thirteen years old, and then their parents were saying, "Well, you can't be around boys." So that's where the idea of actually building a school that would be indoor would be possible yeah. for the girls to keep on, keep on, keep on skateboarding. So I didn't go to Afghanistan with the idea of starting a skateboarding project. It yeah. was something that simply grew out of the just yeah being that's on the ground. That's fantastic, man. That's incredible. And, uh, Can I say something wow. about that? Sure, man. Absolutely. Hey, Oliver, I've been to the one in uh, Cambodia. Wow. Yeah, it's um, great to have you there. It was beautiful to see these kids and girls. It, it's amazing how it's really affected the girls because they have been oppressed so heavily around the world. And for them to rise up and to use what we love skateboarding as a almost like a it, it's not an excuse. It's more of like a platform for them to express themselves and to accomplish something and to watch their, like you said, their faces light up, you know, when they're riding and to see a, a place like Skate Stand, you know, wherever you have the locations to be an outlet for them to, to be accepted and to be loved and to, you know, want to help them not only learning tricks, but education as well. That is huge and it is beautiful. And I was so stoked to go to that one with Steve Van Doren and Tony Alva. And uh, it, it was an incredible experience. So congratulations on the success of how you're, you know, you're changing, changing children's lives. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fantastic. Christian. That's really, really appreciated. Mm -hmm. And it was, yeah, it was exciting to have, have, have you out there. I mean, right now, um, over the last 40 years, um, 40 years ago, only six out of 10 girls finished primary school. And mm. today, nine out of 10 girls finished primary school. And that's, yeah. that's like, that's wow. a huge, yeah. Yeah. We've, we've, come a, we've come a long way. There's still, but there's still 10% of girls around mm -hmm. the world that don't finish primary school because it's seen as too hard in places like Afghanistan, in South Sudan, in North Korea. So many places where we've got to we've got to do what we can, and if skateboarding can play a small part in that, then I'm pretty yes. excited about that. It's awesome, beautiful, it's incredible. Like that impact, I, I've noticed with uh, Christian and and Steve. I know that you guys started your kids very young skating, and I was able to to witness that. 
and uh, they're incredible. I mean, was that something you always had in mind to like really teach your kids to <coughs> skate or be a part of that whole scene? Yeah, of course. I mean, we want our kids to be influenced by the things that we do. Preferably the good stuff. <laughs> Sometimes the bad comes out too. But um, yeah, I've, I've introduced them to music, art, skating, you name it, anything that's a part of my life. Uh, I like to share that with them because then I get to enjoy the things that I love with them and see if they are attracted to it or um, something that they're inspired to follow and progress at. Um, so, you know, at an early age, it's good to have that foundation and, and give them that. Um, just so I feel like I've offered something to them um, useful, you know, because right. it's been useful for me. It might not be their path, and I don't really put the pressure on, hey, you need to do this. Mm -hmm. But I like just sharing my passions with them, and hopefully they, they catch on to that. Yeah, on the tail end of that, definitely it's all about passion. You know, when you're raising kids to be, you know, successful or courageous or have ambition or want to succeed at, you know, uh, dreams and goals, because I was a kid like that. I was a kid that had big dreams, big goals, and I ran after them full, full on. And I was passionate about it. And when my father saw me and mother, they were like, fanning that flame they were like stoking the fire. right and so for me i just try to stoke the fire in their lives and i ne i never tell them what they should or shouldn't do i just tell them what i love and i let that action speak louder than words and right if they're into it they're into it i don't want to be one to force my children to do anything and i just expose them to the things that i'm you know a part of and then share with them the opportunities they can have by being, you know, a Hasoy, by being part of this legacy that, you know, everyone on this panel has, you know what I mean? We all have a legacy that's powerful and for us to share that with our children and even our children's friends and then the kids of the next generation. We're not just raising our kids. We are actually being role models and, and mentors for this next generation. And so as I do it for my kids, I try to do it for every kid in the skate park and even my peers. I just try to be a, a great example to them as well. And so that's great. I mean, especially for kids, you know, like music and, and skateboarding or sports in general, it's like teamwork, you know, a focus and you have to, to practice to go to the stage, you know, you just don't go there. You, uh, a lot of the stuff that don't, people don't see in the front, you know, that's the stuff that you teach at, at home, you know. I created a band kind of for my son, you know, Johan, he's 23 now, just for him to be on stage, you know, not to put the amp on the 20, uh, 20 an amp of 110, you know, uh, your instrument is in tune and stuff, you know, be prepared so you can enjoy as well, you know. So uh, I think sports and music are a great way uh, to go. I do the same here. Johan can play guitar, he's going, he has a band, he likes to, to, to be in this world professionally. But my other two kids, you know, they, they, they really don't enjoy too much that backstage world and all the pressure that goes to, to be on stage and stuff, you know. So uh, no pressure, it's just like uh, Christian would say, you know, example, and let them be exposed, you know, to the world and really learn something from themselves, you know. Because we could be like any school or any doctrine or church, you know, to say, this is right, this is wrong, you know. I mean, there's so many concepts, you know, we all travel the world and we see so many different cultures and point of view about everything, you know. So we should respect that as well at home, you know. So, uh, and Bob, kids, you have kids working with kids or something like that? <laughs> yeah, I have, I have two daughters and, you know, we work with kids every day, at all, you know, kids at the park, kids at the park. Yeah, the influence. It's all our. It's all our kids. Obviously, we have our seed, but you know, when people look up, when you got a small child looking up to you, I mean, that's that, that's your kid in a way. You know, you have to kind of direct and and um, if anything, like Christian said, I think example in the beginning of my, you know, younger, you try, you, you kind of uh, preach a lot. No, not necessarily in the you know in the religious way. It's just kind of like you preach on how you think things should be and, and yeah tend to uh, follow more examples than they are if you're telling them like with the with the finger pointed 
it's just easier for them to go, uh, I don't know about that, you know, because um, you can say one thing and do another, and then that's a conflicted message. So, you know, it's much better. To and better, better than anyone here. You have to fall, you know, to learn something and then stand yeah, up yeah. And, and then go, yeah. you know. Not everything yeah, is perfect. <laughs> totally. My, my oldest daughter, actually, you know, one of, uh, I don't know if there's pressure, anxiety built, uh, building. Um, I had all my trophies and my medals and all the stuff at, in my living room. You know, everything was, was there. And I quickly realized that, I, that I, I had to take that down and put it somewhere else because it felt like my daughter was kind of getting into a situation where she felt like she either achieved that or it wasn't, you know, going to be good right. enough. You know, yeah, so I was yeah. like, okay, no, forget all yeah. this. Outside in a, in a whole other room, whatever. And inside the house, I kept it pretty clean. And, art, you know, she knows who I am and what I do. You know, obviously now she's 20 years old. But I just felt like, uh, I mean, it might, it might be a thing or might not, but I felt like it was better to do that. That was the one thing that I did. Yeah, I remember. It makes sense. Um, yeah. Uh, and Pedro, you are Pedro, you there? My connection here is having some trouble, but I'm here. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you're the, the youngest in this, this group here, and I wanted to know what was like an influence for you to get into skating, you know, coming from Floripa, Florinopolis, and yeah. something, you know, I'm really curious, like what got you inspired to skate? It's it's crazy. It's crazy. First of all, to be here with with all of you guys, you know, and um, it's a big pleasure. And man, yeah, skateboarding in my life came really naturally for some reason, some way. It got introduced in my life when I was under one, so I was like <laughs> eleven months. I'm not even sure, but it just came in a supernatural way. Where a um, really good friend of my my dad's, like they used to go surf. Oh, oh man! Oh, you know, it's funny. I, I remember seeing Pedro. You know, he was he was so young. I, I was with Kelly Slater in in Floripa, and and this he like heel flips like halfway up, and like you know he's just pumping as hard as he could, but he just wanted it so bad. And I remember going like, "This kid's gonna be gnarly." You know, he's just like full so on. <laughs> you know how he could. I mean, Christian, I'm sure, and Steve, like, you, you, you've seen when people are like, you know, especially, I mean, maybe Danny, and you, know, you, you can see the passion, you know, like, right, but you're like, this is going to be insane. And Pedro, I remember, was like that. And I was like, and sure enough, you know, it's like, I mean, he thought just uh, his power, but. Yeah, you know, the passion, the passion, and humble. Yeah. The passion yeah. in Brazil is like no other in the world. And when it comes to like their their desire to want to do something, it's just it's like infectious. It's like you could feel the passion. And for me, I fell in love with Brazil in '86 when I first went. That's a and great story. Bob, when you were a young boy, and I saw the passion yep. in you, I saw the passion in in Pedro and and you know Lincoln and Sandro. I mean, the list goes on. But there was a kid named Leo Caquinho. When I yeah. first went to Brazil, he was 10 <laughs> years old. And he was just yeah, he was my hero. <laughs> he was stylish little ripper at KJ Skate Park, I believe. Yeah. And he had a tattoo on his arm already at like 10. <laughs> <laughs> and he, I'm like, you got a tattoo? He's like, yep. <laughs> he's ripped. And he's like, that's right. Like, that's what we do here in Brazil. He's a big and star. Like, I'm back. I was like, Pedro. is incredible. You can see the passion. We were just talking about your passion when you were a little kid, Pedro, when we saw you. And Bob yeah. said some amazing things and just we're talking about, you know, just Brazil in general. But welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <man. laughs> All right. I think now I'm good. I, I think I got a stronger Wi-Fi now. <laughs> Great, awesome. But yeah, it was crazy growing up in Brazil because I grew up in an island which is Florianopolis, and it's like yes. obviously known Love for it, surfing and just skateboarding wasn't that big. But um, a good friend of my dad called Lil Caquinho, and he's a good friend of Bob's, and he knew his soy <laughs> when he thir was 13. I don't know how him and my dad became friends, but 
that's kind of the whole story came up together because he really introduced like mm -hmm. the kind of real essence of skateboarding, you know, while he came with it. So it, and I think those are the values kind of what Christian and what Bob and Cab were, were saying. It's like, you let the kids kind of do what they want and what they love, but you, you have the duty and you get to introduce and kind of just share what other experience you like kind of collected with life and think that's going to be valuable. And I hey, think Pedro, one the uh, ones, I'm just yeah. curious to, 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 to know how is that uh, Leo Caquinho tattoo nowadays, man? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> how old was he? Yeah, 10 he years ago, he had already had a tattoo. <laughs> he said he was 13. It's and brew. It's a whole different he, tattoo now. He was like, oh, yeah, I was 13 of course. when I did it. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do my first tattoo when I'm 11 then. <laughs> But <laughs> his tattoo is all covered up now and it's um, a new one. But he actually got really excited and now he's got a bunch of new tattoos like Christian where he just started getting tatted up. That's pretty good. <laughs> when I first met Christian, he was like, just no tats, just all like clean and now it's just boom add it up <laughs> it got Bob, my first tattoo it. seven years ago what yes <laughs> it's so cool that you brought up leo kikino because i was just telling him the story about meeting him at 10 years old and his tattoo when i met him at like 10 he was and like that, literally that's 10. when i met i met you the first time with leo right wow, wow. and that's the first thing you said when when you walked up you were like yo leo Oh, I remember you. I met you. You were the kid with the tattoo. That's right. <laughs> That's great, man. I can't forget my dad, that. My dad is 76 and got his first tattoo. It's a Lance, Lance Mountain drawing of a, of a skateboarder that we did for a restaurant. And he showed up at my house. He was like, you know, 76 years old. He's got his tattoo. He's like, I figured I can do what I want now. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> hey, Steve. Yeah. Tell us, uh, uh, tell us about the, the passion of metal, man, and Metallica. I remember yeah. I was talking to Derek here that uh, remember we 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 were a part of the Orion Fest, of the first Orion Fest mm -hmm. that happened in Atlantic City, and they yeah. built like a beautiful structure of skateboarding, which was the Robert Trujillo uh, world, yes, and they yeah. had the Lars Ulrich world and Kirk Hammett world and all the cars from James Hetfield, mm -hmm. three different stages. Uh, it was insane, you know. It was fantastic. Yeah. And uh, tell us a little bit about this connection, heavy music and skateboarding. Well, my first uh, introduction to Metallica was through a skateboarder from New Jersey called Tom Graholski. Oh, Tom Graholski. Uh, I think it was around 1982. I was in Jacksonville, Florida for the Kona contest. And he gives me this tape. And I was in a punk rock band called The Faction right. at the time. Yes. And uh, he gives me this tape. And he's like, hey, you need to check out this band. He's pretty rad. Um, so I look at it and it says Metallica on it. Never heard of it. And I put it on. I'm like, well, this is kind of cool. It kind of sounds, I wasn't really into metal, but it, it had a little punk edge to it, you know? Um, and I just fell in love with it. So I brought it back and I had a, I had a backyard ramp back then. And we'd have sessions on my ramp. We'd put uh, a little cassette player with our tapes and our singer and his brother would session with us gavin and corey o'brien and i put i go check out this new band and i put it in there like oh that sucks <laughs> you're a punk rocker you don't listen to metal you know and then they would they would take my metallica tape out they put their misfits tape in and just to uh You know, just to vibe them back, I'd take the Misfits tape out, put the Metallica tape back in. I would, and I tried so hard to like not like the Misfits because they didn't like Metallica. <laughs> how, how could you not like the Misfits, man? They're like too catchy, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, and what was rad was I saw a photo of Cliff Burton with a Crimson yeah. Ghost Metallica shirt. Oh, I mean, yeah. Uh, Misfits shirt on. And I was like, oh my goodness, they, they like punk rock too. It's cool, you know? So, Uh, eventually, I think Gavin, our singer, ended up liking Metallica, and I ended up liking the Misfits. But yeah, early, early, early time, uh, you know, 80, 83, 84, I, I would go um, and try to find Metallica shirts, and, and I would go on tour with Lance Mountain, and I would go um, 
to Europe and Japan. And I was into collecting records. And I decided to go to these record uh, stores with Lance and he'd pick out all these punk records and I would look for uh, the Metallica records because I knew there was a lot of bootleg records back then. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I started oh, yeah. this huge uh, Metallica bootleg collection that I shared with Derek the other day. <laughs> he was pretty Show stoked. us something, show us something, man. I love the Bones, the Bones one is pretty cool. That's I want like to show favorite. you this one right here. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> oh, that's this one right here is man. pretty cool. Um, Amazing. I got to meet wow. Metallica and uh, at their studio and share my collection with Lars. Yeah. But I, I know he keeps track on all that stuff. I'm sure he was really jealous and he wants <laughs> the stuff that he doesn't didn't have. <laughs> I think he was jealous about this one because this is the only one out of all the albums I had. This is the only 45 he picked out and goes, hey, James, look at this 45 right here. <laughs> <laughs> so he wow. might have not had this one. <laughs> That's killer. Um, oh, wow. But this one was pretty cool. And then I showed Derek this one. This one. This one really is caught my eye. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. like I, I saw, I saw that it uh, before. <laughs> That's so That's bad. Ad. It was really yeah. punk, punk visual, like GBH shirts as well. You know, this this charge and all that yeah. stuff. And the, the, the bullet belts, you know, motorhead as well, you know, was like a lot of that influence that really uh, uh, blended a little more metal and punk, you know, because that discussion you have with your friend about punk and, and metal, it, it happened here as well, you Every, know? Everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> well, it changed with my band, The Faction, because our music from 84 to 85, it started to get a little metal edge to it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think it was James's voice that kind of separate, separated oh. hit them. Oh, from is that the other one? Band. Oh, yeah. There he is. Okay. All right. Mm. <laughs> yeah, 19, that was 1984 uh, in L.A. playing in a That's skate killer. show in L.A. That's, pretty, so that's awesome. awesome, man. So, Bob, I had a question sleep. for you. Yeah, go ahead. But after a cat. Go, go ahead. Sorry. No, and showing me that photo, actually, I'm going into the studio with the faction on Saturday. Oh wow! Yeah. Um, and we're going uh, to record uh, our greatest hits now. All right, wow. from 1980-45. So, the band we broke up the band last year, but all of a sudden I got talked into going to the studio again. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and you're you're starting a new band, though. You're starting. I have a new, a new band, band, but I just didn't want to be a party pooper with the faction uh, deal and say like hey, I don't want to be a part of it. But um, we're going in the studio to record 12 songs. Awesome. Older songs that we recorded in in the eighties. Faction revival. I can't yeah. wait. Sure, <laughs> <wait. laughs> last tour. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a setup. I can feel it. <laughs> I can feel it. It's like oh, Motley yeah. Crue. It's like oh, Motley sure. Crue, man. <laughs> I, I never got to see you guys ever. I'll never do it. I was a big fan, you know. Like I had like all the albums, and you yeah. know, it was really like the introduction of like. That connection with music and skating, like really relevant, you know, in the video. Uh, what was it, the brigade, the Bones Brigade? Yeah. Like, you know, Skate and Destroy. I was just like, holy shit. You know, <laughs> shit. The, connect the connection is there, you know, like, you know, yeah. I, and I always wondered, you know, like, what are skaters listening to? You know, what gets them pumped up, you know, to do the things that they do? And it was great seeing that as a kid, you know, it's like, wow, you know, we really had a big influence for her everybody in my neighborhood, yeah. you know, who were skaters. Um, so it was really cool to, to see that. Um, well, well, back, I'm to, completely... back to skating. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I was uh, going to ask Bob a question about organic farming. It was completely side topic, but I, I was reading something about you being involved in organic farming and, and stuff for, uh, for schools. Yeah, I mean, you know, hey, uh, my the, the way I eat, I mean, has always been a big part. You know, it's like it's 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 what I do, and it's part of like when I was talking about preaching back then was one of the right. things was was that you know, and then I was like, hey, you know, do whatever you want to do. I mean, I think everyone's entitled to do what they want, um, but to me, food and uh, how we demand, you know, uh, you know, if I'm if I'm buying stuff every day, whatever, like the way I eat, I'm now vegan. I've been, uh, I mean, no no eggs, no animal product, no cheese, no meat, no fish, no nothing. You know, I, I mean, I haven't eaten red meat for years, but like, I've just quit everything now. Just kind of feeling the, the performance and, and 
and I feel insane, feel great, uh, just just feel cleaner, and and I've been skating like I feel like I have more energy, and also I know that I'm not influencing a big market that's that's kind of taken down a lot of our trees and the Amazon. I mean, if we were to eat one word to eat every day really can't support so it's kind of like hey this is this is what i'm doing and i've attached the movement of my institute here in brazil that collaborates with a bunch of different institutes and there's there's this institute called new era and they work in uh, tropic agriculture with agroforestry and and how to regenerate because there's a process of desertification going on in the world you know so we need to reverse that and it is possible to reverse it but you have to kind of apply those my diet to a movement to a regeneration process of, of the planet. So that's kind of like, and, and back from what you heard there, it was back when I had um, Burnquist Organics going and I had a yeah. restaurant uh, in Encinitas and we would supply the restaurant with, with the organic food grown uh, at my house at Dreamland. So we're trying to revive that whole process, but now in the, in the um, syntropic agriculture. So in getting in this whole new way of, and stuff. So it's a big part of what I, you know, what I do and what I'm about. Um, it helps me skate and hopefully it, it gets. Me. Wow. That's incredible. Man. <laughs> I think he's frozen there. I was going to ask you guys, it's like diet, a big part of like skating, you know, it's staying fit. You know, it has to be something that's really important. I would think, you know, it's. But it's it's crazy because it's not really something that is um, communicated or really talked about that much inside of um, the the world of skateboarding really that much because skateboarding also comes like a lot from, you know, my turn. that kind of <laughs> urban lifestyle and kind of right. being around the streets, sometimes with not much money or not much infrastructure. And you're kind of just going with the flow and doing what, like you get access to it and a lot of skateboarders don't really get the access and information to the importance of the food, of what you put in your body, of how you treat your body, of, you know, the the mental healthness with your body healthness and yeah. keeping all that in check. We, we now see after 40, 50 years of skateboarding more than ever that to keep skateboarding, you know, and to be like what Cab is doing now, Christian, Hasoy, Alva. The, these big in, inspirations that are the legends that like, if you're going to want to be 50 or 60 and keep skateboarding, you're going to have to really take care of your body, of your mind, of oh, what yeah. you eat, of, of the people surrounding you and all those, those situations. So yeah, it's finally getting a little bit more talked about in our world. And that's really important for sure. Really what about the, the, the Oly Olympic games, you know, like uh, skateboarding for the first time, right? Unfortunately, it, it was postponed and stuff. But how how that that gonna change the the sport? You, you think if build more uh, parks, use the argument. <laughs> it's, <no. laughs> Perfect. it's about to hey skateboarding is in Olympics. Give us more money, okay? That's it. You know, that's how I see it anyway. <laughs> but yeah, but I mean, technically, technically, it's not gonna change uh, much, right? Like, I mean, I mean, uh, about diet, what you you could eat, what is forbidden to take, and stuff. I mean, that kind of stuff can right. change you know the sport you know are there guys like on steroids you know and doing skating or yeah no? like, <laughs> like that. I, don't I, know. I, was on, I was on a lot of other things back in the day it wasn't mostly, steroids. mostly <laughs> things that are gonna make you worse i'm not gonna help i definitely yeah. think that you know us being role models for a diet for healthy for you know, athletic, you know, training. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously Bob and Pedro cab, you know, they're great examples of like, you know, their diet and they're always, you know, kind of like putting it into their, their, their lifestyle of marketing themselves in an organic way. And that's funny, organic way, you know, but <laughs> it's, it's so important because my father always taught me that food is important when I was growing up, when I was 10 years old and I would eat good food to skate. And 
that was a huge part of my training and, and not just in skateboarding, but in life. I think that we're starting to really care about our lives more rather than just one thing, whether it's right. music or skateboarding or whatever it is. I think we're really caring about our lives and it's showing by us using our platforms to kind of like share that, that, that personal message with the people, right. you know, and it's beautiful to see, you know, how everybody does it, you know what I mean? And we're living examples that it, it works, but also it's going to hopefully inspire other people to stay on a, a positive, you know, a fuel intake or even a fuel promotion, you know, for our bodies. And hey. you know, with the Olympics coming up, I think it's going to be a real focus on who is the elite athlete when it comes to like that once every four years event. But does it change skateboarding? No, but I think skateboarding is going to change the Olympics. And we're going to see nice. a nice. huge, huge uh, cultural impact around the world because of guys like Pedro, Bob, Cab, and the whole list of pro skaters that are just so passionate about what they have done, contributed to the sport. And even, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing the effects of it business wise, because that's the huge right. thing that everyone's talking yeah. about. Bob said money, everybody's talking about this, more skate parks, you know, and I believe all that's gonna come in into play, but it's gonna be the, the next generation that are gonna be the on the stage that are gonna really start to mold what it is to be an Olympic athlete. Cause we already have our Olympic athletes in skateboarding. We, we, we know who's the best and, you know, oh, he was the best this day or that day. You know, we all have our favorites, but at the end of the day, it's who's going to perform on that day. Yeah. And I think it, that that's what I love about competition. It's about, you know, the the essence of showing up and just going all out and making it. And that, they, uh, you know, that, that's an energy that because, only those who are there that see it in person or do it, like watching yeah. Pedro make his last run, Bob yeah. Burnquist making that last run. Cab, I mean, it's just phenomenal. But yeah. does that change the 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 culture or us? Definitely not. That inspires us. Right. <laughs> hey, uh, Oliver, yeah, how's it? I'm oh, sorry. Go back. Go ahead. I was going to mention real quick. That, you know, the set of rules that the Olympics brings. I mean, it's like okay, you have to go through that if you want to be in the Olympics, and that's cool. Um, but the reality is, like, I mean, I, I ended up becoming the president of the Brazilian Confederation of Skateboarding out of a movement that Pedro started because of uh, actual federal money that was available to us that was going to a different organization and we had to kind of get moving mm -hmm. and, and, and mm -hmm. flow, that, flow that recourse to us and, and that was done. But what has changed completely is, I mean, I, I grew up uh, without any mom and dad, I mean, zero of uh, public money. You know, you got guys like Pedro now who has access to uh, monthly income from the federal government. You have uh, nutritionists, you have doctors, you have uh, travel paid for, hotels, all that from the federal government. Now you can save money uh, from all your other sponsors and, and then use Amazing. those guys that are in that. I mean, that to me is really what it is the Olympics is bringing. Whether whatever Fantastic. happens there or not, it's just changing yeah. To a lot of these, these guys. I mean, I think hey, Oliver, uh, how's in Afghanistan? You know the the diet and the conditions of kids and girls, and and if you see uh, any chance of of them competing in uh, Olympic games, you know, defending their country through skateboarding. Well, the the standard of the of the skateboarding is still quite low. Um, because we're trying to give as many kids as possible the the access access to it, and people can't just go out on the street, or people can't actually afford skateboards. So um, it does create a it does create a chance, and I think that the uh, I think that the Olympic Games will open up opportunities for girls all over the world, because all of a sudden every single country in the world will have a budget for skateboarding. And half of that budget will be for, for women. So I think it will kickstart 
a lot of opportunities for girls all over the all over the world to start skateboarding and to be uh, to be into it. And I really love how we've been, especially Christian, kept on talking about passion. And I think that that is something that skateboarding is going to bring to the Olympics. The Olympics need skateboarding way more than skateboarding needs the Olympics. And Definitely. that's that's sort of this passion that Skater Stan also brought to the NGO world. Um, mm -hmm. There's lots of passionate NGOs out there. Don't get me wrong; like there's heaps, but there's you know the the drive that everybody had that were that were that were involved with skate uh, Skater Stan. It definitely came from a very passionate place, and with passion, you can move mountains. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I really, I really hope that there's a positive effect on the on the Olympics as as skateboarding is in there now. I feel like that's the main thing from my side, at least, as a skateboarder that is going through a period of being in the the road of going maybe and being part of this competition. I think what really is the movement that we're trying to bring to it is this movement of passion and how the passion and the love can really bring the union and can really move these mountains and can really bring new lights and open new doors for so much and so many people like myself and like so many other kids that had their life changed through skateboarding. And a lot of those people, I'm not talking about even professional skateboarders, but people that found their their love and their light in life through the message that kind of skateboarding can bring and it's really the skate park brings people together you know brings people that have love and have that same passion and those people they care about each other and they're gonna take care of you if you get hurt they're gonna be there if you need anything if you don't have a new board or if your shoe blows up they're gonna go there and they're gonna help you out even if they don't have much like, you know, you're a big example of that. You were going to look for a job in a new country and ended up falling in love and through that passion of skateboarding decided to bring and create a whole new thing for so many new people and so many new lives. And I think that's really what we're trying to bring with skateboarding. You know, a skateboard inside a favela of Brazil can change so many lives. A skateboard inside Definitely. a nice neighborhood can change yeah. so many lives because everybody is going through situations now. Everybody, it doesn't matter really from which class you're from. You're, there's so much problems out there. And I really feel like the presence of, of being alive and feeling alive and being able to share something with people that care and are sharing and caring together, that can bring so much beautiful things out of there. So mm -hmm. it can bring music, you know, like bands were formed after maybe meeting each other in the skate parks. It can bring art. It can bring <laughs> fashion definitely. and, yeah, education. I think so it all creates a place of family too. Family yeah. is huge because sometimes at, at home they don't have the support right. that Skate sure. Stand can bring them, or the skate park can bring them, or the 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 family of skaters and the community brings them that come together. And we're all and that, a family, right? That is huge for this generation to feel welcome, feel loved, and cared for for sure. I love what you said, Pedro. That was awesome. Fantastic, yeah, man. Definitely. I know with bom. uh bom pra caralho, mano. <laughs> Brasil porra. <laughs> and <laughs> pita, mano. I want I know that uh with the music world what's changed a lot is the fact, you know, again, eating and also the less the idea of people partying and doing drugs and stuff. I don't know there I don't know if there was that much of a something with skating as far as people using a lot of drugs or drinking a lot and stuff. I know with Andreas and I that we, we stopped drinking uh, alcohol and we've noticed a lot of people taking care of themselves in the music world, you know, because, yeah. you know, this example of, of who you want to be and who, you know, you're playing to, you know, it's a big example. And I wanted to know if you guys realize like how uh, an impact that you have from skating doing what you love has an impact on so many people around the world when did you realize that wait a minute i might be a role model to somebody <laughs> i need to you know get myself together was there ever no, a moment yeah <laughs> no no no, no, Christian Azoya, no Steve Cavalero, there'd be no skater stand either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> future, 
<laughs> huge influence. And uh, I um, I celebrated one year sober yesterday. So um, nice. All right. Yes. Johan, yeah. Johan, here's here's the skateboarder of the house. Amazing skateboarding. Yeah. This is Johan, my friend. He just want to say hi. Hello, hi. Johan. Hello. 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 <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, he's asking he's asking a question to to caballero to steve when he was the first time he, he did the caballero caballero, caballero. <laughs> caballero. 19, 1980 uh at winchester skate skate i was four years old <laughs> I, wasn't born. I was 13 years old, 12 years old, and I, I was awesome. I was 15 years old, and we were part of wow. a we were part of a a, a contest series uh, where I turned pro. I was it was my rookie year, 1980, and at the time, skateboarding competition is what defines you, and the the best that you could do in competition, you get pictures in the magazine, and it kind of showed you where you're at in the level of skating. And you always wanted to try to place high, so you always wanted to try to bring something new to the table. And so in, in that era, 1980, we were trying to invent tricks and we were trying to be creative and, and progress the sport. And that's what really motivated me to become a better skateboarder and to become higher ranked. And, and so, you know, Winchester Skate Park, I decided to uh, try this trick where you did a fake heel and then you spun around in 360 with it. And that was really just um sounds easy. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just went there and I did that, you know. <laughs> you know the, the, the great thing about skateboarding is it's very it has a very artistic form to it, which you can be competitive at it as well. So the the thing I love about skateboarding is you can't really define it. It's a it's a lot of things. And people like to try to put it in boxes and try to make so they can understand it and that's why you get the diversity in our sport right you know that like the x games they didn't like the x games there's guys that like the olympics that don't like the olympics that's fine you can do that just take skateboarding for what it is and what it can what you want to get out of it but don't try to put it in a box and say that's bad that's good that's not that's that's bad because it may be good for one person but then it may be bad for the other depending on how they approach the sport and art. And so so for me, skateboarding has been the tool that I've used for everything in my life to show that nothing comes easy. Uh, everything comes with hard work, blood, sweat, practice, anxiety, pressures. I mean, it's not easy to skateboard. So if you can apply the, the tools that you use to become a good skateboarder to everything else in the world, you can be good at anything that you put your mind and heart to. Fantastic. Man. You know, uh, I, th I think just going back into the, the, the drugs that, uh, the aspect of the aspect, I think it's important that, you know, you know, humans have had that mind for, for years and years. And, and, and there's, there's a good and a bad side to that. Anything that you abuse um, is, is a hard, is something really tough. Um, but you know, we all, because of skateboarding, I know that it held me together because I've done enough drugs in my life and I don't, and I feel like even some foods that are legal or even some legal drugs, like some of the opioids and some of the stuff that we use because of pain as, uh, you know, I've yeah. broken several bones, right. all of us here, you know, yeah. so, you know, alleviate yourself or whatever. I, I tend now to find, you know, through uh, plants, whether it's cannabis or, 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 or uh, psilocybin with the mushrooms or, you know, whatever different type of aspect. And even um, some of the, the, the deeper consciousness stuff like, um, like DMT and, and, and some of the stuff that's like kind of like takes you on a whole nother ride that can, isn't necessarily bad, but everything right. has to be kind of like taken into a, a, a path, right? Anytime that it just becomes, um, like uh, playful or, or, or you don't respect, it could be with anything. It could be with food, it could be with drinks or anything. And, and I think Christian here is one of the examples that I see, right. I, you know, that is just like, to me, it's just so rad to see that turnaround. And I'm sure that for him was a tough go through, but um, you know, it was, it was an exit. We, we find exits, you know, like when something's tough and then we, we you know, even crack, 
cocaine is like that. People go into crack because their life is just so insane and then they're self-medicating. There's no criminality there. There's like a serious um, uh, uh, health issue there. And we right. have to change yeah. the perception yeah. that, that, those, that that's really what's going on. People are trying to go away. And when you go home and you have a drink, it's okay too. But you're trying to like relax from your day and you're trying to give yourself a, you know, there's, there's things that you do, but anything you um, could, could be totally fine. But not all of us have that personality and, and we have to watch. So I know that skateboarding has saved me several times because it kept me on the street. Anytime I would go out and do any type of drug, whether it was, you know, uh, especially the heavier ones, I couldn't skate, you know? And I was like, shit, I, I want to skate. I don't want that. So it would, it would take me in back into that path. So you have to find that passion or you get lost in, in, in life, you know? And even with, you know, and, and things that are going on in this world that are just really hard. And it's like, you know, and you would think that skateboarding, you know, holds people together, but we've had, issue with with stops uh top skateboarders committing so sad because yeah. you think like hey skateboarding's there but it's not life is not an easy thing and you have to go deeper than that so not just skateboarding safe but your own spirituality and you finding your connection with the divine is really what's going to save you no matter what religion <clears throat> to connect deep because if not skateboarding can become shallow you can get lost in yeah. that too you know, so music too. I, I mean, we see the weird. example of, of uh, Chris Cornell and unfortunately yes. many other yeah. big stars you know, committing suicide as well with music and structure and family and everything. You know, yeah. it's something really deeper than, than that. Yeah. Well, Christian, you're 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 mute. You're... <laughs> yeah. When it comes to suicide, I, I believe oh, yeah, that yeah. there's something missing in the person's life, and they. They fill their life up with everything else that they think that's going to give them the excitement, the enjoyment, the satisfaction. And it just goes to show you that someone famous and someone rich, that that stuff doesn't bring you the fullness of life. Yeah. I mean, it's a proven fact. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. if you're yeah. out there searching for fame and fortune to make your life happier, that's not necessarily going to happen. I mean, there's a That's lot of wrong world, the wrong world, <laughs> rich people, yeah, you know, early on, early on when I was young, you know, skateboarding did save my life because I was t experimenting with drugs. But then I was like, that's taking me away from skateboarding, just like Bob said. And I knew that it, I wasn't, you know, one one contest. I was with Jay Adams. We stayed up all night. I did coke all night. I went to the contest. I was like, I got this. You know what I mean? I'm going to smoke everybody. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I got third yeah. place. And I was like that's the last time I'm going to do drugs again before a contest. And that was an epiphany at 16 years old. But then as time goes on, I went like, you know what? Hard drugs is going to affect my skateboarding and I want to be the best. And so I made a decision to not go deep down those roads. But I was always trying to fit into, say, the culture. I was always trying to fit in and be the cool guy. And as I got older... When I got into crystal meth, I think that's when, you know, we have tried everything. We're going through life's difficulties. And then you're searching for, like, identity again. And when there's pain or hurt or you're dealing with some things, I think you try to cover up the pain with uh, addiction or substance. And you, at first it's for fun. You want to go out and party and have fun. And then all yeah. of a sudden it becomes this thing that kind of slowly gets to be a dependency that now takes over. And now you don't master it. It masters you. And that's where I believe that people have something missing in their hearts. And I say I, I, I searched for this thing, this void in my heart in all the wrong places. Girls, money, fame, traveling, popularity. And it was this void in my heart. And I always say it's, I was searching for love, true love. Because I tried to find it in those things, but then I finally found it when I hit rock bottom and I landed in prison and I, and I found out that God loved me. And that's when I realized that, like Bob said, it's a divine thing. Something happened and I realized that there was a purpose for my life and that God had a plan. I wasn't just here to do the best, be the best, you know, be, you know, everything that I can be and then die. You know, I, I realized my influence now is important. I realized, like we were talking earlier about, you know, when did I realize that I was an influence on people? Well, right. that was early, but then when I realized that my 
purpose was to influence people in the positive, like Tab was saying, the good things we want them to follow. I think that now as adults, I'm 53 years old, just yes, day before yesterday. What? Man. Yeah. Libra man. No way. I got I got 21 years of sobriety coming up this January 23rd. Bam! Fantastic. Yeah. 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 It, was, it was all because I had the life experiences that take me there. That's why I don't regret anything I did. But exactly. now I use yeah. them as exactly. a tool to help other people make decisions. And that's why I love telling my story. I love sharing it in my book and my documentary yeah. on this platform. Very inspiring, man. You know, always. And yeah. just to just to say that, you know, it, it was when I finally accepted God's love and I knew that He loved me that I could, I could like feel that void just be filled. And now that, that void, it's like a cup. I always say my life was like a bucket full of holes. I put all that in, it would drain all out, put it all in, it would drain all out trophies, money, girls, all that stuff. It would drain all out. Finally, I put that love in and it just filled up and now it's overflowing. And I just want to share it with everybody. And you know, it's funny, my name's Christian. My nickname was Christ on the cover of Thrasher in 85. I invented the Christ air, and I never read a Bible my whole life. And I finally get to prison. I read a Bible, and it was like, boom, the scales fell off my eyes. Wow. I realized that Jesus was real in my life, and I went, wow. I said, you know what? I'm going to try and be the best Christian, you know, because I was like, I'm going to be the best skateboarder in the world. First, it was I was going to be the best martial artist, Bruce Lee. Then it was skateboarding. And I said, I want to be the best <laughs> awesome. Christian in the world. And in prison, I just did nothing the but the best practice. Bruce Lee ever. Yeah, yeah. that's it. And we, we are the role models of the future generations. And that's what I want to be. I you know what, Christian? About role models, man, we have to mention today about Edward Van Halen. You know, that's mm -hmm. the. A, a musician or guitar okay. player that okay. for for any guitar player for any musician and stuff mm -hmm. and i just want to ask about what van halen means you know to you all if means Ooh. something you know because for yeah. us is uh i mean for me you know for any guitar player is it's, uh, it's a whole new revolution you know jimmy hendrix mm -hmm. did a, a new a, a guitar revolution and then edward van halen did a, a complete another mm -hmm. revolution that showed a whole new way of guitar playing and everything and he also suffered a lot of the abuse of you know uh, tobacco alcohol cocaine many years during the 80s i mean the worst for that type of situation because everybody was doing that stuff not only musicians but record label people press people everyone was doing it was something normal you know and they were like almost like guinea pigs, you know, trying new drugs and trying new things because they have money and everything, you know. So um, he also was a victim of this kind of situation, of course, cancer and everything. But uh, I just want to, you know, say thank you to Van Halen here live right now. I mean, we can see all the guitar players and musicians are very emotional because you, you start to remember how much important and how much a part of your life uh, he, he was or he is you know i remember first time i listened the first album i remember when i saw that th those pants that i wanted to be the same as him or trying to pick up the the, the pick you know the same way what the fuck is doing with you know it was, was everything it was so much importance in my life that was i didn't even realize you know and um anyway van halen <laughs> rest in peace <laughs> yes yeah so so many people come out you know like it, it, the way I feel like people come like Jimmy who's gone quick, you know, and Eddie now, I'm sure it's quick. You know, he's, he's done a thing, but if he would have held off during those years, you could keep on manifesting these beautiful things. So it's life cut short form, uh, you know, in a way of suicide because you're cutting your life, cutting your life and your light, your, your, your energy and what you can really put out. Now, who God knows, you know, the, 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 the deepness of his, fight inside you know because i mean i was yeah. listening to christian talk and and i know you know going through it i was lucky growing up that you know my mom would always you know i, I grew around spiritism <clears throat> um christian spiritism so you know it was always like hey no matter what you are uh, or what you feel like you are you're just like that person that's cleaning you got that same value you're not better than anyone just because you skate better you know so i would always keep myself in check in that way because if you don't have that check, you, you start rising above the crowd. And when the reality hits, 
then you're like in deep shit. You're like, wait, I'm not that big of a deal. You know, who am I then? Yeah. Now you have no value. And now you yeah. want to destroy your life because you have no value. So it's almost like, you know, I, such talented light people go so early, you know, and you're thankful that they came through, but it's, you know, it's not easy having that limelight constantly on you. If you don't have a deep root inside, you know, into that divine, uh, then it's, it's easy to, to let it go, you know? Yeah. So, you know, Eddie Van Halen, I mean, it's, it's just, it's insane. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a sad day, but death is part of what we are doing. You know, death is part exactly. of it. Yeah, you perfect. know, my Jamie, uh, my uh, Van Halen is I used to play Jamie's Crying at almost every contest, you know. And <laughs> That's it was awesome. Like my what a choice. Song, you know what I mean? Because it, it's, I saw Van Halen, I think, 1980, you know, in L.A., Coliseum. Ah, okay? That and, hurts. And, yeah, yeah. And it's fantastic. so for me, growing up, listening to, you know, rock, I, my father was huge in music. And so I was being educated at music at, you know, I, I went to Bob Marley. I've seen Bob Marley twice. Seven years old, I went and saw Bob Marley. Oh, my wow. God. Stop, man. Dude, at, please. Heaven, you know? so, <laughs> so for, for me, you know, I really appreciate all music. And it wasn't like I was one or the other, you know. And I, I'm so thankful for that, you know, open uh, uh, discussion that my pops would have with all of his albums. You know, the blues, the, the rock, the folk music all of it you know what i mean yeah. the reggae that we had even the uh, the old motown but van halen was our day it was right. the kids you know that took it and ran with it it wasn't the adults i think the adults were were into it but it was the young was generation too new for them. that took yeah. that music and like used it as a platform to start their own style of music from there and so that was you know Right when it happened, all I could think of was Jamie's crying and 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 all the times that I would play his music and you know I just uh, prayed for the family immediately and just all the fans. It's amazing. Just, yeah. it, it, it's pretty incredible how Van Halen impacted us. For for me, it was uh, 1985. Listen, listening to the radio and jumping up and down on uh, on the bed. Um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a as a ten year old, and then uh, later for Skater Stan, um, the story about how they used to uh, be very specific about their rider and how they uh, put a certain amount of uh, they didn't want to ever have brown uh, M and M's in there or something like that, and sp uh, applying that. So basically the idea was that because they did such complicated sets and they were so big, they didn't want anybody to make any technical mistakes in the setup of these huge arenas because people could die. It could be really dangerous if people don't set up the shows right. So they had this right, they had a thing in the rider where they said, you're not allowed to put any brown M&Ms in there. And if somebody, if they found a brown yeah. M&M in the rider, then they would know that maybe the lights weren't set up right or maybe some part of the technical exactly, setup wasn't yeah. right. And I really took that to heart with um, creating Skater Stand, like really trying to make sure like, okay, if we're going to wow, set this up, awesome. we're going to set it up really properly and the details actually really, really matter. And how can I communicate things so that I can get a message across? And that was a very clever way of you know, making sure that these shows were safe in the 80s when yeah, they were doing yeah, right. shows bigger than anybody else. And uh, that was their way. Uh, I thought that was super clever. That's interesting. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. I'm going to use that. Fantastic I'm going to use that. Brown. <laughs> that. <laughs> that is great. That's but great. That, I like that. Yeah. Yeah, my really work to Van Halen was through skateboarding because before I got into skateboarding, I was listening to soul and disco you know and i wasn't into rock and roll but when i went to the skate park kids were listening to rock and roll and i wanted to be a skateboarder so i wanted to fit in so i went and bought you know to tower records and bought you know acdc cheap trick aerosmith and van halen tapes and uh fantastic i felt like a, I felt like a skateboarder then i felt like i feel <laughs> you still have those disco you still have to have the disco uh 
uh, 45. You got anything from that? I still BGs. love before you're I still the Bee Gees. <laughs> nice. Got so a well. summer. Oh, yeah. You name it, bro. Awesome. <laughs> That's dance right. Floor. I was on it's the dance floor. Yeah, yeah. I, told, <laughs> funny. I told James Hetfield that same story, and he's like, Oh man, you were in the disco. <laughs> <laughs> I used to hate that stuff as well, but now I I, I, oh. I think it's great. You know, they have great musicians as well. I mean, for, compared to what up, we man. listen today in Brazil, especially, it's crazy. <laughs> Maturity. You're, you're like Hetfield. I was ten years old. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> was older. It doesn't matter. Village people. Village people. Influenced by, you know. <laughs> You know, so skateboarding influenced me into rock and roll, which then turned into punk rock, which then turned into, you know, you know. <laughs> and then went into rap. <laughs> hey, Bruno, do, do we have some questions? We, we didn't have any chance to open for questions. If you, if you. Yeah, we have like some questions here. I'm going to pick some, some of them. Yeah, why not? We're almost at the end here, so. Could answer some it's people from all over. Crazy questions from the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hold on just a little. Come you on, guys Bruno. Are, are you guys yeah, like we, a, we, see we, you guys we, adrenaline junkies? Do you see you guys as that's like your drug of choice? Like adrenaline is that most people here that, like are really happy and like sending us masters of like uh, I'm gonna put some of them for you all to to see. Hello guys from Sepultura in general. I'm Felipe from uh, Lagoa Santa, no, Lages, Santa Catarina. Which uh, is your influence in sport in your life? Thanks by your attention. Uh, I didn't get it. Anyone? What, can, <laughs> what is the influence? Oh. Bruce Lee in sport. Oh, in sport. Yeah, martial arts. I see. Well, okay. Bruce Lee, uh, baby. Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee. Evil, <laughs> Evil Knievel was my influence. Oh, nice. I like, I, I, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a horrible like skateboarder. <laughs> <laughs> I like bicycles. Bicycles a lot. I like to bike a lot. But the skateboarding and surfing is really bad. I'm a big LeBron James fan. Cleveland. That's right. Represent. Kobe, baby. Kobe. Stop. Rest Kobe. In <laughs> Rest in peace. Kobe. I saw Michael Jordan. I saw Michael Jordan play once. So you, you're talking about Bob Marley. I talked about Michael Jordan. I have to, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> hey, I got a trophy. I got a trophy from Michael Jordan one time. That was pretty insane. Oh, wow. Wow. It was the Laureus. I got experience. the Laureus Award from him. Wow. I was like, man, yeah. that's. I was like, right on, dude. You're. All, he looked at me. He's like, I heard about you. You're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he got the right guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's right about that. <laughs> David Daniel da David Roseland, thanks for mentioning and Eddie Van Halen. Rip Eddie. Eddie, sure, man. Word up. Yeah. Was that a question? We have most people here not sending questions, they're just like happy and sending like ah, cool. about Eddie Van Halen. And also, we have like uh, uh, an interesting uh, question here. Like, in it's not a question, like a commentary here in Portuguese. I'm just trying to find it. But when, it, when they were talking like about kids and everything, just let me find here because we have so many questions. <laughs> Uh, Oliver, just just uh, tell us uh, how you know people who wants to be involved in Skatistan, you know how how they do to to get in touch or to yeah. to try to help somehow donating or or volunteering or whatever you know. Give directions, please. Uh, super. So um, at all of our skate schools, it's only really people from those countries. So in Cambodia, it's all Cambodians. In South Africa, it's all South Africans. So people can uh, uh, um, 
volunteer in different ways for the overall uh, organization. We're also trying to, as much as possible to help every single social scape project in the world. And um, we've identified around 200 projects globally in 55 countries. And we're, we're supporting all of those, including one actually in, um, in, uh, in Brazil, in Rio, called Colectivo Skate Mare. And um, so we're going to, like, if anybody has a social skate project and they want to, like, put it on uh, put it on steroids, like, make it bigger, do do more stuff, get in get in touch. We we we've got a whole whole lot That's of resources. Great. We want to we want to help we want to help everybody. And of course, you can donate to the organisation. You can follow us on social media. Um, love to get uh, celebrity endorsements uh, for the for the organisation. So if anybody wants to to get involved, yeah, please uh, please let me uh, let me know. Hey, um, Oliver, yeah. I, I want to say that, you know, it's, it's so cool to, I mean, I've heard of, of Skate Stand for a long time, and I, you know, it's great to, to hear the story of, of, of how it, it came about. Um, it's been about seven months that my institute uh, was born here in Brazil. Uh, so I know about the Mare, and I know about um, everything that's going on. It's just an inspiration. We just locked in a deal with a university here called Uniswan. So we're going to be doing... With schooling and and all that uh, at the island here in Rio, so I'm, but my institute isn't about doing things only you know uh, that I'm doing. I'd love collaborating with other institutes and other projects. So it would be great to connect with you somehow, and maybe we can help each other out on your Brazil um, uh, side of things. You know, because my institute awesome. works in Brazil only. Yeah, so that'd be amazing. Could, that could be a cool thing. I just put my um, email here into the. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, so be. I'm reading this question here. Um, that the all right. That the Thanks, Bob. In entertainment. <laughs> um, no, I, I just want to say. I mean, I, ever since this whole thing started, obviously we we, we got we, we think beyond that. We want to think about everyone's health and safety. Make sure everything's good. We're still trying to understand this thing, and you know, so we want to make sure we take care of ourselves, and you know, and and walk. So ever since it started, I had this opportunity of working on this uh, drive-in model um, and was able to create this, this event called Spot Lab Sessions. And you guys, I'm sure you heard of them, but uh, Ego Kill Talent, um, we did a show oh, with yeah. them. And, yeah, so uh, with, with all those guys. Yeah, good friends. And uh, a couple other bands and even Papa Chino, the DJ, the producer. So we mixed and we did a big show with rock and, and, and B. Uh, and uh, we we paid homage to Charlie Brown Jr. as well, and, nice. and, we had, and we had a vert ramp in front of all these cars at the uh, Allianz Park Stadium. So it was a way that we were able to put something together, not a competition, more of a cultural event with music and skating, and I think something cool was born, and I'd like to take it around Brazil <laughs> with different bands, um, and it would be insane to do a Sepultura uh, version at some point. It would be Let's awesome. Let's do it, man. Let's we do just it. gotta keep reinventing, um, you know. And yeah, it, it was a drive-in model, but you know, I think that we entertainment is very uh, important, especially now that you know people are in this depressing, uh, negative uh, mind frame. You know, you have to come yeah. with a crisis like this, rise above that negativity, and go into solution-based situation. You know, I mean, every it, things can get better. A situation that happens like this will. And I think it brings people together uh, way more so than a world war. You know, a world pandemic, True. I think, brings people in, in a way that there's more solidarity. And I think it changed for the better. Even though there's a lot of suffering, I think um, people had to shock themselves into thinking of, uh, of each other. You know, so I agree. Uh, uh, I you agree. Know, you just got to keep moving. Yeah. Well, it's, it's also showing us what's valuable and what's not valuable. Yes. Showing us that yeah. anything can be taken away mm. at any moment. So when you mm. hold value to the things that can be taken away, it's just showing you that, that that's not as important as you think it, it is. You know, so even mm -hmm. in this pandemic, we're, we're all learning and we're all growing. Um, 
it is causing diversity as well. I mean, there's, there, it's on both sides, you know, but it's bringing people together. It's, it, it really depends on your attitude, you know, and how you, you treat yeah. it. And, you know, I always carry a positive mental attitude with everything. You know, everything's a learning experience. Um, and you just take it for what it is. And you kind of just look at the, look at the, uh, the bright side of an incident. Because even something that, that, that looks terrible or something that's terrible in your life can be a blessing in disguise. Uh, yes, because we're so, definitely. as humans, we're so short-sighted, we can't see the future because we're not that wise. But the wiser that you, you are, the more that you can see the future um, of things happening in front of you. So uh, it's really, it's really good to uh, to experience these things and, and and grow through them. You know, and, and pain and suffering is part of life, man. You can't go up. You can't. You can't live life without it. People right. try to yeah. avoid it all the time. Yeah. You know, uh, it says in the Bible you gotta face that, it. <laughs> uh, that patience is, is, is long suffering is the definition of patience, you know? And so even with patience, you're suffering, you know? And a lot of people have, they lack patience. Yeah. You know? So, Especially nowadays. I mean, everything's sure so enough. quick, so fast. Like, you know, everything has to be right there. And, you know, and I think the pandemic also uh, uh, showed a little bit of a, a different perspective in time. You know, we shouldn't be running. I mean, why you're so desperate to get where? <laughs> you know, it's like uh, we should really enjoy. I mean, uh, we we came, we come from a generation, uh, an older generation that uh, we didn't have, uh, you know, uh, phones and and YouTube and all that stuff. You know. The first contracts that Sepultura was signing with our label was through fax machines and one call every 15 days, <laughs> you know, to resolve <laughs> business and stuff, you know. So, but that was time, our perspective of time, you know, what we have today. We have today in WhatsApp, you have like, I don't know, 100 people in a group that we talk to them every day. I mean, this is insane, you know, not even with family members or friends. It didn't, suppose uh, it wasn't like that. You see a friend or you go to school, you have a certain time in school with your friend and stuff, and you have a life, you know. Nowadays, you, you talk to so many people all the time, all the time, and why, what are you doing, you know? So uh, hopefully this pandemic also will bring a new perspective for people, and we should really take our time and not really, you know, lose energy trying to, to be too, too, too anxious for the future, you know. The cream is going to rise to the top. You know, people are, are, you know, when, when people get put in situations, trials, tribulations, it's a motivator. I always believe that, you know, these things will motivate the people who are trying to make a difference. They're going to rise up and they're going to do something about it, you know. And so it, it's always, you know, not enjoyable at first. But I think what Cab says, it's like we're going to come out of this even better than we would have if this didn't happen because it's going to truly reveal who we are yeah real exactly. Absolutely. and real For musicians sure. and real skaters and real people who really truly right. love the their Perfect. community their families their children and especially what their occupation is i think that it's going to really mean a lot to to the heart and soul of what we represent and i think you know it's funny how the punk rock and, and hardcore skaters are the ones that were the rebels to try to wave the flag of like, you know, political change or not sit in the box or we're going to, you know, do it our way. And, you know, I think that now as, as wiser people, we're really caring about more people than ourselves. And yeah. we are looking out to make you know, headway, Skatistan, Definitely. Sepultura doing this, Bob doing his thing, Pedro and his dad, Andre doing their thing down there, and Cab, you know, and his platform using it to influence people in such a huge positive way. It, 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 the cream's going to rise to the top, and I'm just trying to do my part, you know what I mean, in, in inspiring people to not, you know, fall over and, and just give in. It's time to rise up. We don't want to we don't want to survive in this. We want to thrive in this. Right, guys? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 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 Well said. Yeah! Yeah. 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 The yeah. The yeah. yeah, the new wave Drink taking charge. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I think there's like no better there's no Bruno. better way like to finish this chat here. It was yeah, amazing. So we want to thank everybody that watched it here, and we want to thank everybody that was here, our guests. And right now we're gonna have Sepultura playing false. Woo! Ah, right. Masters. Thank, you thank you very much. Yes. Thank you so thank much, you everyone. Guys. It was a fantastic right, chat. Guys. Hopefully, we see each other soon. Animal. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you